Okay, you can go ahead and start introducing the speaker. Thank you. Can you hear me, Professor Stefano? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the second to last uh, event in the speaker series of the uh, 2021 International Conference on Engineering Synthetic Cells and Granules. Um, just to remind you, there will be uh, one more speaker series event uh, next uh, Monday. And then the main conference uh, will take place May the 18th through the 20th. And as another reminder, you can already register uh, for the conference. It's free. Go to the conference website, syncell2021.unm.edu. Uh, so uh, today it's a, a pleasure to, uh, to introduce first the presentation by Professor Hendrik Dietz, uh, who is a professor for biophysics at the Technical University of Munich in the physics department. Uh, professor uh, Dietz uh, completed his um, undergraduate studies in physics at the LMU, uh, also in Munich. And uh, uh, then uh, he did a postdoctoral uh, fellowship at Harvard Medical School. And uh, after that, since 2009, he has been a professor at the Technical University in Munich. So uh, welcome, Hendrik. Thank you, Dr. Um, so I, I, I guess I can overrule the screen sharing now, right? I guess uh, I will yeah. do that. And um, I, I assume you can hear me, is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so hello everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about our work um, on designing biomarker devices and machines. First, I want to spend some time uh, explaining sort of the general mission of the, of the lab. Um, so what, what are we interested in? So um, in my lab, we'd like to build artificial marker devices and machines, ideally, devices and machines which can accomplish sophisticated functions, maybe similar or even surpassing those known from natural molecular machines. We wanna be able to integrate such function modules into higher order systems and then use them for something useful um, in, uh, in society. Um, and um, maybe the question is sort of why am I particularly interested in this particular question? So I'd like to Motivate, motivate this a little bit with the help of this photo. I think this is a little bit old. This is, uh, I think, from probably from 1910-ish or something like this. Um, so what you see here are two horses drawing a carriage. And then there's one of these early automobiles. Uh, and it's not clear whether the car is actually uh, taking over the carriage or whether the carriage is taking over the car in that photo. Uh, it doesn't matter for the point I'm trying to make. So this is a metaphor. So we kind of um, can think of sort of the horses embodying the state of molecular biotechnology, sort of everything that we can know to do with molecular devices. Basically, we pick pieces from nature, antibodies, polymerases, molecular motors. We tinker with them a little bit. We can adapt them to a certain extent, but sort of horses remain horses, right? There's only so much that you can do, you know, with a horse. Whereas if you knew how to sort of uh, engineer molecular machines, molecular devices completely from scratch, like we do with cars, right? Then you have, of course, much greater freedom to build something that really suits your needs. And I think uh, we're in an exciting time right now. So we can see that there's a lot of increased control about building increasingly sophisticated molecular devices right now all around the world. Um, I think we're not even there that we could say we have the, the, you know, the analogy of a car in terms of syn uh, synthetic market devices, but we will be, get we will be getting there um, eventually. And also, I mean, even though like the early cars, they were not so great and people were a long time debating on whether they actually need cars. I think nowadays 
it's clear that they have completely taken over uh, the role of, of horses, right? So sorry for this a little bit um, metaphorical introduction, but um, with that, I want to tell you what we're actually doing. So um, we, we'll, we would really love to contribute to this um, development in some way. And what we're trying to do is to, to push as much as we can um, 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 an effort in trying to build complex complex molecular structures and try to encode them in DNA sequences, nucleic acid sequences. Um, and so basically, without going into too much detail, so thanks to over 30 years of um, work in this field of DNA nanotechnology, we are in a position nowadays that we can basically sit in our offices and uh, design synthetic molecular structures through a rational engineering approach. And basically the result of that engineering approach is a list of sequences for DNA single strands, which are designed according to a specific set of rules. And then if you actually make those molecules, for example, via solid phase chemical synthesis and put them together in a liquid solution, they will self-assemble into a three-dimensional structure, if you did the design correctly, that is fully specified in the sequences. Um, so one very popular um, design approach in the field is known as DNA origami. I'd like to illustrate this process with the help of this movie. So this is an illustration. It's not, uh, it's not aspiring to be an accurate physical representation of reality. It's just an illustration. So basically what you're seeing here, uh, first of all, is a very long um, DNA single strand. We usually call this a scaffold strand. It's like kind of the backbone um, of what's going to be our structure. Um, and then we have these uh, colorful short uh, pieces here. These are short DNA single strands, which we call staples. And they're designed in such a way that they are partially complementary to particular spots on the scaffold strand. So then when, they put, when you put everything together through the fusion and self-assembly process, um, all these molecules, they come together and they actually, um, by lots of base pairing with the scaffold, they fold the scaffold strand into a structure which is fully encoded in sequences and in, in the sequence in this case of the of the short oligonucleotides in this case you get um, the product will be um, a simple rod where you have 10 DNA double helices which are linked together for multiple crossovers into this rod like shape okay so this was fiction now comes uh, reality um, so what are you seeing here are uh, I think uh, these are 47 objects that we actually made over the course of the last three years. Um, and everything that you see, but everything, what is, um, everything that is yellow and blue actually is made entirely from uh, DNA molecules and sort of completely synthetic. And these objects that you're seeing, here, they, these aren't models or anything like that. This is actual data. So what you're seeing here are structures that we determine of these, object, of these objects using uh, single particle cryo-electron microscopy. And as you can see, there's a huge diversity of shapes um, that, and that you can see here, right? And, and the fact that you can solve the structures uh, using cryo-EM also reflects the fact that these are properly folded and well-defined. So you can build small objects like those shown here in an outer, in an outer orbit, which may com comprise like 50 oligos or something like this, like the small one here. And there can also be gigantic objects like this big yellow ball in the center, which I think, um, if I remember correctly, uh, I think uh, comprise about 30,000 oligonucleotides. Um, and then just for uh, basically give you like a sense of scale, there are also two natural objects included here. Um, so on the outer orbit, <laughs> there's this magenta colored object, which is showing up here in the back. This is a um, actually uh, a protein membrane pore called the XAB, it has a molecular weight of 800 kilodalton. So it's about the same size of some of the other origami objects here. And then this um, magenta colored sphere here, this is actually an hepatitis B virus core capsid with 30 nanometer diameter. So basically the bottom line is with the modern methods of DNA nanotech, we are in a position to rationally engineer a huge diversity of shapes on the, um, on a size range, which is commensurate to the scale where natural molecular machines and higher order uh, and complexes live. We can also use cryo-electron microscopy to further um, study these uh, objects in uh, sort of in greater detail. So this is one of the, um, an example of the one of the more recent uh, structures that we have solved, um, which was a random movie. So this is a cryo-electron 
uh, microscopy map determined for an object which has no particular function other than to have this uh, kind of uh, you know weird shape in a way. The point is sort of you can use this structural validation method and you will actually be able to see every helix in this entire object with a detail uh, that sort of that you can recognize sort of major and minor groove. You can see all the crossovers that hold the helices together. And with this level of detail, you can actually go and also refine your um, your designs so that they actually fit specifications. Um, and then with, with such data, you can also fit um, and construct pseudo-atomic models. So basically um, infer uh, the, the coordinates for all the at atoms that make up the structure. And this is something that we did here for this electron uh, uh, density map. So now we have an atomic model for this object. Um, I think this one comprises on the order of 50, 500,000 atoms. So we have the coordinates for every every single one of these 8,064 base pairs where this, uh, which this object is made of. Um, yeah, and I'm rotating it. And then you can go in and analyze the geometry, quantify whether you're happy with particular aspects. You could try to refine the design so that it fits your specifications. And with this kind of um, process of experimental validation, atomic model fitting, we have now um, several atomic models available, which we're using also just to troubleshoot our design rules. And I'm going to uh, just run these movies here. And then uh, you may notice that these two objects here actually look fairly identical. Turns out these are actually two variants of the same object. So the, 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 the top one is the one I just showed you. And you can see that this object actually has some twist deformations. This is also one of the reasons why we made this. We wanted to study global twist deformations and how they relate to particular design decisions in the interior of the object. So now we, we saw it's deformed. So we can actually go back to design and fix that deformation rationally by you know, repositioning some crossovers. And now we have a new version of this object, which is much straighter. And again, this is then validated experimentally. This is just reflecting the fact that this is really has become some kind of engineering in a way. So then this is a snapshot, basically like somewhere in the interior of one of these objects, um, this sort of reflecting where we are in terms of the resolution that we can obtain using cryogenic microscopy. So it's only order of four angstrom, that's where we are right now. And this resolution, you can kind of see the discreteness or like sort of, you know, uh, it, the discreteness of the, of the, uh, of the Dina W helix, right? You have these bumps here, which are presumably um, reflecting the phosphates. Then there's a little depression here. This is presumably a missing phosphate because this is actually a terminus of a strand. It doesn't have a phosphate. Uh, and then here, this is a strand crossover. Obviously one of these molecules, uh, you know, uh, changes the, the, helix, the helix and you can rotate it and you see this little density is actually um, as a single covalent bond. So I'm actually kind of happy to see this. And now you can, uh, it's, I mean, it's at least conceivable that if we can push the resolution a little further, you can actually do a rational placement of chemical moieties and additional functionality so that they are, are at the correct relative positions to, for example, you know, template some catalysis or something like this, but to, if you want to do something fancy. So I'm coming back to this overview. Um, you may ask now, what is this good for? All this, so actually there are many answers to this question. So now um, many colleagues in the field have, um, have built various devices for various purposes, starting from sort of um, applications we, which are not so uh, material demanding or you know, where the DNA nanostructures don't need to survive in outlandish environments. So there's a lots of uh, useful tools in biophysics and biochemistry for sort of niche science questions, but this is still valuable. And now sort of as the field progresses and we know better how to make more durable structures, more accurate structures, also the applications grow and they're sort of in scope. So today I wanna to share with you um, something we've been working on for multiple years now. Actually, we started working on this in 2017, I believe. And in 2019, we started doing, working on the type of project I wanna explain now, uh, so pre-pandemic. So we're working on as a kind of uh, um, virus neutraliz neutralization uh, therapeutic agent. So, and we call this uh, in our lab, the Venus virus trap. So for those who are not familiar with Venus traps, so Venus traps, um, Venus trap is a carnivorous plant um, that sort of, it can trap insects in a sticky leaf and then digest the insects. So kind of what we wanna build is something like that for viruses. 
Um, and that was an idea that, that came before uh, the pandemic, but I think it became all the more relevant. And um, so this is um, a, um, a collaboration actually. So uh, all the people named here in white are working in, um, in my laboratory at TUM. And then we have Werner Kolbe, Florian Wilsch, and Ulrike Plotzer. They're from an institute of virology, the virologists and physicians, also located in Munich, the German Center for Infection Research. And then we also have help and a lot of input from soft metaphysicists from Brenner's University, notably Mike Hagen and Seth Freden, who also was in the lab for a, for a year. Um, and then these are the people who have been driving, who, who drove this work in my laboratory, so Christian Siegel, Anna Lavina, and then two postdocs, Walter Engel and Jessica Kretzmann. And I, I think they did a great job. So, okay, again, what is the goal of this work? We want to build a macro market device that can trap viruses. And uh, the idea is that if we can trap viruses and engulf them completely, we can prevent potentially um, viruses from undergoing interaction with host cells. And sort of inspired by neutralizing antibodies, this if you could do this, this would have the potential to reduce the viral load in acute infections and just give the people, patients, more time in developing an effective immune response to get rid of the virus. Um, and I'll say more about that therapeutic window uh, at the end of my presentation. So what I'm going to tell you now how, um, is basically build some previous work. We made some uh, important progress in building large structures in 2015 and 2017, which enabled us to build the kind of objects I'm going to share with you now, which are not yet published actually. So, um, so basically what we're building is we're trying to build a pretty large, massive, pretty large macromolecular shells that are even bigger than actual viral pathogens. So like hundred nanometers or even bigger. So the, the approach that we chose is as follows. So we're building triangular um, building blocks from DNA. And what you're seeing here is a cryo -M map, actually one of these objects that, that we built. So it's an equilateral triangle and the, the, the edges are beveled at a particular angle. The angle is chosen such that you can take 20 copies of this triangle and then you put them together by the edges, they will form a closed icosahedron. And then also if you look at the edges, you will find that there is a, some funny protrusion here and then some recesses and they're actually shape complementary. They kind of encode a particular relative orientation in which you can click copies of these triangles together uh, in order to form such a shell. And then here's another variant of such a triangle that we've, um, that we've built. It's, no, it's an isosceles triangle. So this edge is actually longer than the other two. And this one also has a different rule set encoded in terms of how copies of this triangle will interact with each other. For example, here's one protrusion and this protrusion fits only onto, into this, in the hole on this edge. And then here's a protrusion on the bottom edge, which actually fits into the same edge. So this is a particular rule set in which, in which this thing can polymerize. Also the bevel angle here is more shallow, which allows this triangle to oligomerize into a bigger shell. So with these kind of tricks uh, and using sort of careful uh, engineering, is driven by data from cryom, we were able to make variants of these triangles, which self-assemble quite efficiently into these higher order shells. So you can make octahedra, icosahedra, and then this shell, which actually contains 60 copies of this triangle. And then this shell actually contains 80 copies of two triangles. So, um, so this actually approaches, um, well, this one, no, we have, even, we have an even larger shell, which is not on the slide because we don't have a cryom structure, but even larger one actually has 180 triangles. That's about one gigadalton in molecular weight. So it's pretty big. Um, so then and this is pretty, pretty robust. So you can take these shells, for example, and just stick something on it and they will still assemble into, into nice echocedrons. We made a spiky version of this echocedron just to and solve the cryo map, just to see whether that would actually work and it did. So then here's a raw um, EM micrograph just to see um, how that actually looks sort of, we just look at single particles. So this is the T equals three um, capsids, many copies of them. They look a little bit like clean viruses, sort of. Um, and then here is maybe some some of the building blocks. But overall, the yield is actually pretty good, um, thanks to the uh, refinement that we did with the uh, with the structures. So then, um, yeah, I can skip this. So then, um, the this is a cross section of the of the icosahedral shell. So you see, this has this thick wall and all these circular 
cross sections. These are um, these are affecting the cross sections of individual DNA double helices. So this one has a diameter of 100 nanometer. The cavity is about 80 nanometer in diameter. <clears throat> this is the bigger shell, for, made from 60 of these triangles. This one has a cavity of 150 nanometer. So you can actually stick, if you wanted to, you could stick the icosahedron inside. And why I'm putting the icosahedron in here is because this is pretty much identical to the uh, average dimensions of the influenza virus or like a, even the SARS-CoV-2 virus, actually it would fit into the shell. So it's, they have achieved the, prop, you know, the, the appropriate size with these, with these shell designs. So now, which raises the next question, how do we actually trap viral particles in these shells? Um, so basically there are two different routes that you could follow. You make shells, which actually uh, pretty much like a carnivorous plant is basically is ready and you know, it's patrolling through the body fluid and when it, you know, viruses can enter through some aperture and then they get stuck there. There's one route. The other route is it sort of that you kind of dynamically assemble these shells around viruses to fully engulf them. We have invested most of, most of our work actually in this uh, avenue. Um, and to do that, we had to learn how to make partial shells, shells which are actually not fully closed, right? You, you, because you need an aperture so that the viral particles can still diffuse them. So I'm sharing with you some variants. So this is a variant of the icosahedral shell, uh, which we re-engineered so that basically the multimerization stops at the half icosahedron. So, and again, it's a well-defined structure, assembles with uh, decent yield so that we can actually solve a cryo map of it. And it's like a half icosahedron. So now you could imagine also you could, you could have two copies of this half icosahedron, they could click together, right? Uh, and then here's another variant, which is a, a little bit more close. Now, basically one of the pentagon vertices of the icosahedron is missing. So this has a bigger, it's like a more like a bowl. So the, it's a bit more floppy here, the edges. That's why it kind of it looks, this looks frayed, but sort of, it seems to be well formed. Okay, so now we have shells with apertures. Now we need to figure out how we can actually trap um, viruses. How can we make the shell sticky for target virus? So I want to illustrate the many options that you have there um, with, this, um, with this scheme here. So imagine you have one of these shells. So since it's made of DNA, we know where all the DNA strands are. We can um, site-specifically conjugate you know, all kinds of moieties to the interior um, surface of these shells. So one moiety that comes to mind is antibodies. There's plenty of antibodies available against all kinds of stuff. So what you could do is you just you covalently link a DNA tag to these antibodies, and then you can sort of, you could make a variant, for example, where the entire inner surface is completely plastered over with antibodies. That's conceivable. But you can also put their host receptor domains. An example is, you know, the ACE2 uh, receptor on the lung cells, for which the spike 2 protein is sticky. You could take this receptor domain and just present it here as a kind of a decoy uh, to trap the SARS-CoV-2 viruses there. There's peptides, aptamers, many options that you could, uh, that you could uh, work on. So just to prove a concept, we made some variants of these shells uh, in which we, um, well, to which we conjugated um, antibodies um, in the first set of experiments for an hepatitis B virus core capsid. So now we have some, these are half octahedra and you can see here some of these spherical objects in there. These are actually hepatitis B core capsids, which are specifically trapped by this half octahedra by antibodies, which we conjugated in the interior surface of these uh, octahedra. Um, you can also do this with the bigger shells and then, you know, get pictures like this in an extra microscope. Again, these spherical particles, these are hepatitis B virus core capsids. Um, and then here are our DNA shells and they're specifically functionalized with antibody against this hepatitis B core capsids and you can, you can trap them in there. Okay, so this works and here you have many, um, the viruses are here in excess. So that's why not all of them are sequestered actually in these shells. Um, we solved a cryo map actually of um, a hepatitis B core capsid trapped by two half octahedra. So in a particular stoichiometry, you get many of these structures actually, which looks kind of funny. It looks like a tie interceptor from Star Wars. So the, the little sphere is actually hepatitis B core capsid. And then you have these two DNA shells which coordinate this thing. And then if you increase the, uh, the density threshold, and then you can actually see there's signal in between the, the virus and the, and the wall from the DNA. And these are uh, sort of randomly fluctuating antibodies which hold the viral, uh, the viral capsid in, inside. Okay, now um, next question that we have is, um, 
does the virus trap actually prevent virus surface interactions? We did plenty of experiments to this extent. Looking at the time, I'm going to skip skip one and just advance. Um, so we did uh, much work in vitro, so to speak, with sort of artificial surfaces to uh, troubleshoot the uh, sort of you know the the surface blocking capabilities. And now I'm going to show you some work with live cells. So um, what we did is the following. Um, we have here a pristine human cell line. Um, and what we did is sort of, we took adeno-associated viruses as a model system for an infectious virus, um, which, was which were carrying an EGFB gene, green person protein gene. So here the idea is if uh, such a hex cell is infected, actually it will express green person protein, which you can evaluate then using flow cytometry or process microscopy, for example. And then the idea is now we can sort of, if we have a, you know, a known amount of viruses, which we uh, uh, give to cell culture, we could uh, add our shells, for example, specifically modified to trap the identical associated virus. Then we can evaluate how many of these cells are actually still turning green, right? That's, that's the way how you would basically measure neutralization. Um, so then this is how this looks like. So this is sort of um, a first microscopy view of many cells. So here's the nuclei stained with a different dye. This is the EGFB channel, many cells turning green when you just give them a certain, uh, uh, at a certain multiplicity of infection, adeno associated viruses. And by comparison, if you add these shells, then actually very few cells turn green. So the shells actually successfully prevented the viruses from entering the cells. There's still lots of cells here. You can see the nuclear channel. And now an important control experiment uh, is sort of to just do the same thing with just the antibodies at the exact same concentration, effective concentration in which we had antibodies here. If you do this, we still have many green cells, which shows you one key advantage of these shells. Basically, they allow multivalent binder binding of these antibodies. And this is much stronger than if you have individual on and off binding of these antibodies. Right here, you need many more antibodies to actually effectively completely uh, passivate the, the pathogen surface. All right, so the cell, um, cells were happy, just skip this. Um, and then the latest news um, is that um, we also did this with actual hepatitis B viruses in human cell lines. And um, this is quantified in this way. Um, you see here sort of the neutralization is measured in, by quantifying the amount of a viral antigen that is shedded by infected cells. So you can do this, for example, uh, you know, four days post-infection or eight days post-infection. And we have shells which are specifically functionalized with an antibody. And if you own, if you only give the antibody exact same concentration, you basically get zero neutralization. The, all the cells are getting infected with the hepatitis B. You know, all of the concentrations we looked at. But if you put the antibodies in our shells, you know, get very, very efficient neutralization. This is all very good and promising. So the virus trap concept works with live cells in cell culture and nasty physiological fluids with nucleases, etc. So now a question, which is more a little bit of an out outlook, is does this actually have any therapeutical merit? So uh, this is something that we need to answer in the future. I just give you some few interesting points. So you may have heard about monoclonal antibody therapies as a therapeutic intervention, specifically for COVID-19. So there is, um, um, so the, the FDA actually has granted emergency use authorization for this region cough. Uh, it's an antibody therapy. Um, it's, a two, it's a mixture of two antibodies, which are neutralizing the SARS-CoV-2 viruses. President Trump go, got some of these when they were not yet uh, released. And the idea is that they do exactly the same thing. You add the antibodies into circulation, they neutralize and prevent the viruses from uh, interaction with host cells. Similar ideas also pursued with these designed mini protein inhibitors. So I think there is a therapeutic window here potentially we don't know yet how this stuff will work in an organism, something that we need to test. And a good question you might ask is why not just do antibodies in the first place? Well, there are many answers to this question. First of all, you could, but you know, in many instances, neutralizing antibodies may not be available. And they're also subject to mutational drift. So they need to bind in a very specific way on the virus surface in order to be neutralizing. And it's actually hard to get. Um, and with the shells, you don't need that. And you basically get, you can think of these shells as a sort of really structural scaffold that can enhance antibody efficacy through avidity, right? Even if the antibodies are individually weakly binding for multivalency, they will bind strongly. And then you have the occluding effect from the shell material. 
And then um, there's a little bit of subtlety. Another advantage is that you can basically each and any, you know, you could use any virus binder and multiple virus binder and different virus binders to just specifically target a, vir a viral pathogen. So we're excited about this. So we'll we continue to push this, we're going to test this in organisms in mouse. Um, one option is also to look into omnivore virus traps, something that can sequester different types of pathogens. You can pick up influenza and SARS-CoV-2 and maybe something other, something else. And then we also have the option to include virucidal moieties. You can think of proteases, for example, enzymes which will destroy surface proteins in the viral pathogen and really deactivate it. It's another interesting direction. So there's a, a consortium that we have formed, funded by the EU European Union. I have the honor to lead this. Uh, includes virologists, physicians, chemists, and us, nanoengineers, as we call ourselves. Uh, and then hopefully we can bring this to a um, sort of level of technical readiness that we can uh, that we can make an informed decision about whether this is sort of something uh, worthwhile to pursue for the future in the future. Okay, um, how is the time, Darko? Darko, you're muted, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, take a few more minutes if you'd like. Okay, so I have, uh, two more things that I can advertise. I cannot talk uh, about this in detail, but both both things that I'm going to uh, share with you briefly, they're all posted on, on BioArchive. You can uh, look at the complete survey you want. So two more things. Uh, so one um, interesting study um, led by Eva Bertolzin in, in, in my lab, um, really talented PhD student, is this as a nanoscale reciprocating rotary mechanism with coordinated mobility control. That sounds fancy and maybe a little bit hard to digest. So I want to I want to tell you what that means. So it's actually, by the way, it's a work in collaboration with uh, Alexei Aximentov lab and Crystal Maffeo um, at, um, at University of Illinois at U Urbana-Champaign. So what we built is basically is a rotary mechanism um, in which much like an ATP synthase, basically the rotation of the rotor induces cyclical reciprocated motions in the stator. Basically the orientation, you know, where the rotor is, it will deform the stator in a particular way. And this is kind of how you can get basically coordinated motion. So what you see here is a movie from a simulation that was on uh, in Alexei's lab, where basically the rotor was forced to rotate in a particular way. And you can see how the structure basically cyclically deforms. So basically yeah, much like an 80% is where the gamma shaft, as it's rotating through the different uh, state orientations, it basically pushes the uh, the stator pieces outwards. So with this, uh, with this mechanism, at least you have a coupling now, where sort of where the orientation of it can induce specific, you know, or in, uh, deformations in the stator. And then we hope that we can exploit this in the future, like you drive rotation for chemical reactions, or maybe if you mechanically rotate this shaft, we could maybe use this to do chemical synthesis uphill. And and AFA actually did a lot of single molecule experiments. Uh, with using single molecule fluorescence and also single particle cryo microscopy to verify uh, that this mechanism actually works. And so you just basically just more like an advertisement. This uh, very, um, you know, a few example structures. This one is the most interesting one, basically taken from an analysis of heterogeneity in, uh, in cryom data. We can reconstruct basically a movie of a, of a moving rotor inside of a stator. And the other, uh, thing that I want to share with you also posted on BioArchive is this study is a synthetic tubular molecular transport system. So we asked ourselves the question whether it would be possible to generate a one-dimensional random walker from DNA components, which is as fast as a natural molecular random walker, like for example, kinesium motors in the absence of ATP. And we succeeded in doing this. Pierre Stummer worked on this. Again, a very talented PhD student in my lab. And there's a movie of uh, a DNA random walker labeled in green. This movie um, is approximately real time, real time running on a DNA filament labeled in red. This is about three micrometer long and basically it's moving. Uh, with, uh, I think this system is about 500,000 times faster than previous artificial 1D random walkers. And if you're interested in how we, how we made that happen, please have a look at the paper. And maybe we can publish this eventually in some in some actual journal, but it's on my archive, so I have peace of mind. Um, 
So this, I want to uh, thank you for uh, for listening. Um, again, I have my little metaphor here of the cars and horses, which I love at this moment. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, um, here's my Twitter handle. So you can follow me on Twitter. You will be updated with uh, you know, the, our latest publications. There's our website if you want to check it out. And my email address. And then here, I want to highlight all the member, members of the lab, current scientific staff, everyone working really hard to make uh, the whole machine work. Um, yeah, now I take any questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Hendrik, for a, a fantastic, inspiring talk and the beautiful microscopy uh, pictures. It's an exciting uh, motors and walkers. But we have a couple of questions uh, uh, about the, uh, the virus trap. Um, so one question is, are the DNA shells stable in actual physiological conditions? Yes. <laughs> yes, that just took us about a half a year, but the answer is yes, because I mean, all of this would be completely useless if, it, if they weren't stable. So the answer is yes, there is a particular treatment we do uh, that, that makes them stable. Thank you. And related to that, um, so after uh, the trap traps the virus, will, uh, will it be uh, degraded in the body or, or does it just float around as a neutralized virus? That's a good question. Um, we don't know how to answer the question. We assume it will get degraded. Um, and my sort of my virologist partner in crime, Ulrike Potzan says, um, even though, I mean, you could hypothetic, hypothetically, you could think of, of the following scenario, you have the virus trap, it sequesters the, uh, the virus. After a while, the shells get degraded and the virus is free again to do its job, basically. That's the scenario. But our virologist says that actually anything that you do to somehow delay the, um, the to somehow uh, you know, reduce the infectivity will help buys the body time to mount a proper immune response and kill off the pathogen. So this is even this, even if that would be the case, that could be useful. But we have uh, lots of additional ideas, right? I mentioned we could include um, proteases that would uh, degrade virus surface proteins and then the virus would be broken and couldn't longer do its job. Um, Thank you. Uh, we, have, uh, we have one more question, uh, a comment that says, uh, the Venus virus trap is a beautiful tour de force. And are there extensions of this approach that could be applied to antibiotic resistant microbes? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I think the issue with microbes is that they're here. <laughs> so this, the, this idea of engulfing them will be hard to do because it's so much bigger, obviously. So you would have to do something else. So some uh, a while back, I was very, very much excited of building artificial uh, membrane pores. So kind of devices that could sort of uh, punch pores into, uh, into membranes. And the idea was that maybe you could, we could build such kind of pore punchers so that they specifically uh, you know, lice bacteria, but this um, I think that's something for the future. But I don't think that shells will do the will do the job. There's too much material that you need. Um, uh, a, a few more questions. Uh, so the work that you describe focuses on achieving function through elegant engineering of structure. Uh, how about extending into dynamics to engineer biomimetic nanobots, such as artificial mimics of motor proteins? Uh, are you planning to systematically explore design rules for uh, such potential nanobots for applications uh, such as in harsh environments? All right, that's a good question. So, yeah, I mean, we're working, working on uh, trying to actually establish actual motors. So um, the two mechanisms that I, sh uh, that I shown, basically these are passive mechanisms that have degrees of freedom, but they're basically they're just randomly driven through these degrees of freedom, freedom through thermal forces, right? There's no active um, process that would actually somehow rectify them, their motion. So we're working on trying to establish ways to um, make actual motors. And if we had motors, then we could <laughs> potentially also nanobots that do work uh, and whatever the environment is, but um, this is something for the future. Okay, uh, I'll ask uh, 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 one more uh, question uh, before we uh, move on, uh, and that is, um, are the DNA nanostructures immunogenic? 
It's also a very important question. So I think the answer to this question is um, um, is not yet clear. Um, so the we have been working on studying the innate immune response um, to these kind of structures, and there is basically two kind of mechanisms that are part of the innate immune response. So there's these toll-like receptors that can detect G, uh, CG motives and in DNA on the extracellular side. Um, and if you basically, you could imagine just making structures which don't have those motives, CG free, so you can basically bypass that detection method. Um, and the other part of the innate immune response is um, an intracellular DNA uh, detection method in the cytosol is something that the cell considers as potentially harmful, this could reflect intrusion by a virus. So there's enzymes um, and one, proteins that detect DNA intracellularly, and we have, we're in the process of studying that response. And I don't can I cannot give you like a, a clear answer at this point. So to some extent, there might be immunogenic, but uh, this is something that needs to be studied. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for your talk. Thank you for listening. Uh, so the second speaker uh, in the session today is uh, Kevin Janke. And he is a PhD student in the Gepri uh, uh, group and uh, uh, at the Max Planck uh, Institute for Medical Research in Heidelberg. So uh, Kevin, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, just let me share my screen. Okay, this should work now. Um, yeah, so hello everybody. Um, my name is Kevin Janke. Um, as Darko said, I'm a PhD student at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in the group of Kessin Göprich. And today I actually want to talk to you or tell you how we can actually merge the capacities of top-down and bottom-up synthetic biology to engineer a rather complex signaling pathway in which proton gradients from light harvesting E. coli control DNA assemblies for synthetic cells. And in general, in bottom-up synthetic biology, we try to build a minimal cell module uh, to study or even re-engineer basic biology. And the idea is then to little by little increase the complexity by combining many different of these individual modules uh, to then in the end end up with a synthetic cell. And towards this aim, we actually also developed already uh, quite a few dynamic systems in which we can, for example, induce the targeted ectomyosin contraction inside cell size compartments um, using DNA uh, and uh, upon light stimulus, which you can see here in this video. Um, but we can also, for example, engineer the motility of actin contain uh, containing cell size droplets, which you can see in this video here. In this case, it's a rotational motility, but uh, we can also change the setup to induce a translational motility of these cell size droplets. And uh, finally, we can, for example, also look at the division of giant unilateral vesicles um, up on a light stimulus. Uh, one, of, one example I show you here, where we actually have a DNA containing giant unilateral vesicle, which is dividing uh, up on light illumination. However, as you might already see from all of these systems, there are still a few drawbacks. So on the one hand, we still rely on natural proteins um, that make up the cytoskeleton. In this case, it's actually actin. Uh, and secondly, we don't have an energy regener regenerating system. So once the, the energy is um, um, released, it's actually gone. And therefore we actually pose the question, if we can, for example, build a DNA-based cytoskeleton, which also, and, and a system which also includes an energy regenerating system. And the problem is if we stay in the bottom-up approach, this is actually rather difficult because we still rely on the purification of proteins. Many buffers are incompatible with each other. Uh, and there's a lots of, just lots of crosstalk. And additionally, the efficiency of reconstituted proteins is often uh, much lower than they are in the natural state. And therefore there's a different approach to synthetic, synthetic biology, which is the top-down one. And here we actually start with a natural cell and we start by reprogramming it with different functions. And the idea is then to take apart the unessential components little by little um, to then end up with a minimal uh, synthetic cell module. However, also here we have a problem because we don't really know all the essential components uh, that are necessary to build actually one of these 
minimal synthetic cells. So taking them apart is, is very hard if you don't know what you're looking for. And therefore we actually tried to merge um, the advantages and um, capacities of these two approaches um, to in the end and uh, engineer a more complex synthetic cell pathway than one of these two approaches could do on its own. Okay, so in order to get an energy regenerating system, we actually started off by top down engineering genetically modified E. coli, uh, which you can see here in this sketch. And um, these E. coli are special in a way that they actually overexpress a prote uh, proton pump, which is, so, uh, which is called xenorhodopsin. And the cool thing about xenorhodopsin is actually that up on a light stimulus, so you just illuminate the E. coli solution with light. Uh, it induces a proton gradient across the membrane and thereby acidifies the E. coli interior and basifies um, the outer aqueous solution here. And this is something we can also verify with pH electrode measurements. So this is just about measurement of the outer aqueous solution uh, when we put an epi of these E. coli um, into a pH meter. And what you see here is actually that only up on a light stimulus, the pH is actually increasing by about 0.8 from 6.2 to 7.0. And once we turn off the light, it's actually dropping back due to dissipation of protons, and then we can start the whole thing again. So this way, we actually have a rather nice um, energy regenerating system, which we can trigger by light illumination. As a next step, we actually went on and encapsulated these genetically modified E. coli into uh, surfactant stabilized water and oil droplets using droplet-based microfluidics. Uh, one exemplary image you can see here on the bottom left, and then we um, actually try to reconstitute the same um, light responsive behavior inside cell size compartments. In this case, we use the pH sensitive dipernin, so a fluorescence based readout, since we cannot go with a pH electrode uh, into these um, water and oil droplets here. And what you can see in this plot is actually that we can reconstitute the same um, light responsive pH behavior. So only if we illuminate um, our droplets, the pH of the solution is actually increasing and then it's dropping down over time again. So what you've seen here is actually that the E. coli act as light activated synthetic organelles that change the pH inside, our, uh, inside compartments. And now the question arises, um, how to actually make use of these proton gradients. And since we're a group uh, working on DNA nanotechnology, we actually use the rather common triplex motif, which is just a pH sensitive motif, um, which upon basification of the, um, of the solution is opening up. So these Hoxstein base pairs here are actually um, destabilized and thereby we have the triplex in this open conformation here in which it can actually undergo a strong displacement reaction with a partially complementary DNA and thereby form this duplex here. And now you might wonder why the single stranded DNA here actually contains a cholesterol modification. And the reason for this is actually that we found that cholesterol tagged single stranded DNA molecules are actually inserting uh, at the um, droplet periphery of our surfactant stabilized droplets and thereby act as a recruitable handle there. So in this way, by, by using the system, we can actually induce um, the localization of the triplex molecules to the periphery by changing the pH. So at low pH values, the triplex will just stay in the uh, aqueous lumen, whereas at higher pH values, it will open up and then bind to the droplet periphery in this way. And this is what you can also see from these confocal images here. So at low pH values, the triplex is just uh, homogeneously distributed, distributed in the droplet lumen. And the higher we go, the more it's actually binding to the droplet periphery, having a turning point here at around pH six. And now we made an interesting observation because if we put a fluorophore modification on the single stranded DNA here, just for visualization purposes and verification, um, we actually found that this equilibrium state here is shifted towards higher pH values. So what has been pH six before, now if we have a Psi three modification on the single stranded DNA is actually now at, at pH 6.5. So what we see here is actually that the fluorophore makes a difference on the conformation of our DNA nanostructures, uh, which was really um, striking. And uh, we tried to pursue this further uh, by looking at MD simulations of single stranded DNA oligos. And I wanna show you two here, one is, um, uh, an MD simulation of unlabeled single-stranded DNA, 
And uh, one is the simulation con of the same DNA containing a Psi3 modification. And what you see in these videos is actually that the one with the Psi3 modification is much more likely to be found in this rather compact conformation um, that you can see here in which it is less accessible for duplex formation. And um, this together with dynamic detachment experiments um, actually led us to the conclusion that on the one hand, the unbound single stranded DNA state is actually stabilized by the presence of a dye, but also once the complex is formed of single stranded DNA and triplex, this is also um, stabilized by the presence of a dye, uh, leading to this free energy um, sketch that you can see here. And we even went one step further by uh, testing 12 different combinations of fluorophores, either on the single stranded DNA or on the triplex DNA. And just the take home message from this year is that the fluorophore modification actually has a dramatic impact on the binding of our triplex molecules to the droplet periphery. So there are some combinations in which the binding is not inhibited at all. And then there are others in which the binding is completely inhibited. Okay, but now coming back to our E. coli based system, the, the obvious idea was now to combine the genetically modified E. coli and our DNA based system in which actually um, the pH makes difference on the conformation of our DNA um, by recruiting it to the droplet periphery. And here in this confocal time series, you can actually see um, what in all droplets containing genetically modified E. coli and um, the triplex DNA and the control tag DNA. And what you actually see is that over time, the DNA, the triplex is actually opening up and binding towards the droplet periphery. And the nice thing is that this only happens upon light illumination. So we actually have proof that this is due to the um, basification of the outer um, aqueous solution due to the proton gradients um, from the E. coli. And now the interesting thing here is actually that once the DNA, the triplex is localized at the droplet periphery, it does not go back. So it just stays there. Whereas we know that the proton gradients from the E. coli are actually reversible. And this was pretty interesting. Uh, and what we found here is actually that the small gradients from the E. coli system, which are about 0.8 in Delta pH, are not sufficiently high enough to lead to the detachment um, of the um, DNA from the droplet periphery, whereas higher pH gradients actually um, manage to detach the triplex also from the periphery. So um, what I showed you here is actually that the E. coli mediate the DNA attachment to the compartment periphery. Um, however, that this is only reversible for high pH gradients and therefore not um, with our E. coli based system. And now once we can actually attach the triplex DNA via our E. coli, uh, the question arises how to achieve a more meaningful function. And in this regard, um, we now actually designed a much more rigid DNA-based structure, namely DNA origami, um, which we actually modified at four positions um, with the triplex molecule, thereby making it, its attachment to compartments pH sensitive. And the DNA origami is about like 50 times 50 nanometers, uh, which you can see here, it's a two layer sheet. And additionally, we designed the DNA origami in a way that it's actually able to undergo blunt end stacking interactions on all of its four sides. Um, and for this, we just need to add the edge staples um, at the scaffold seam here, um, which then induce the blunt end stacking. And how this looks like, you can see here from these AFM images, so if we omit the stacking interactions, you will actually see the DNA origami monomers loosely distributed on the mica surface here. Whereas if we induce the stacking by adding the staple strands, uh, we see these huge micron-sized clusters um, of, of DNA origami. And what happens actually if now we if we attach these clusters now to giant human vesicles, so by moving also to a physiologically more relevant uh, system is actually that you see these dramatic um, deformations and morphology changes of our initially spherical giant human vesicles. So what you see here is the lipid channel at elevated pH, and here you see the DNA origami. And what is striking are these really long straight kinks um, and boundaries, which are presumably these huge micron-sized clusters, which just form these flat sheets um, on, on the membrane here. And the nice thing about um, our DNA origami based system is actually that it's pH sensitive. 
So what we can do is we can just lower um, the pH by, by adding an acid. And what we see is that the DNA origami will detach from the GOV periphery and our GV, GOVs will actually go back into their spherical shape. Um, and a different um, phenotype, I would say, um, compared to this deformation, um, which we actually observed, is the suppression of membrane fluctuations. So what you see in these videos here is once just a deflated plain GOV, not containing any uh, DNA origami, uh, which is wobbling around. And then on the right, you see a DNA origami um, covered um, GOV, which is very, very static, and you don't see any membrane fluctuation, nearly no membrane fluctuations at all. So we also see that we actually change the compartment mechanics via our DNA origami. Okay, so lastly, um, the aim was to now combine our DNA origami-based systems together with our genetically modified E. coli. And we managed this in a two-step process. And the first process was actually that we immersed our GOVs in an E. coli-containing solution, which also contained the DNA origami monomers. And then by illuminating our um, solution here, we actually um, induced the DNA origami attachment to the GOVs. And this is what you see here in this video, uh, which is also verified here in this, um, in this plot. So what you see here is actually that only upon light illumination, the DNA origami signal at the uh, GOV periphery is actually increasing. And the nice thing, since this is light mediated, we can even do this sequentially. So after waiting some time, we can just illuminate our sample again and then uh, induce more DNA origami to attach to the GOV until a certain threshold is actually reached here. Okay, so now we have the DNA origami monomers on the GOV surface. And then in the second step, we actually need to induce the DNA origami polymerization on our uh, membrane. And this is done by just adding the staple strands. And here you just see, uh, you see a GOV containing um, or surrounded by, by genetically modified E. coli. And now the solution contains the staple strands. And what you see is actually here again, the formation of these large kings um, which correspond to the DNA origami polymerization um, on the GUV membrane. So what you can see here is actually that proton gradients from light harvesting E. coli mediate a DNA origami induced morphology change of our giant unilateral vesicles. And therefore to summarize, um, what I've just showed you um, is that or how, actually, how we can actually merge the capacities and advantages of bottom-up and top-down synthetic biology by engineering a complex signaling pathway in which light illumination of our sample uh, or of the genetically modified E. coli actually leads to a pH increase of the outer solution. This in turn causes the triplex to open up and making uh, the DNA origami monomers attached to the, to the GOVs. And then by adding the staple strands, we actually induce the DNA origami polymerization on the GOV membrane, which in turn changes the compartment mechanics and morphology. And with this, I'm at the end of my talk, and I would um, like to acknowledge the many people that actually um, helped during this, this project here. And I thank you for, your, um, um, for listening to me, and uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions you, you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin, uh, for presenting this impressive work. Uh, I'll start with a, a question. Uh, uh, it, it, it's as follows. Uh, several diagnostic methods use strand displacement reactions and computation with fluorophores and quenchers for visualization. Have you tested if the most used fluorophores, uh, Tamara, Texas, et cetera, have a strong effect in um, single strand DNA strand displacement reactions? Um, so the fluorophores we use, like, we did not use Texas Red in this case, but we were mainly based on, on Psi 3 and Psi 5, um, so cyanin dyes. Uh, and additionally, we were testing um, a few Atto and Alexa compounds um, because, I mean, if you look at the structures and the charges, um, they, they are very different. And for us, it was just important to get like uh, a little bit of everything. So some that are positively charged, some that are negatively uh, charged, and some, some bigger ones, some smaller ones. Um, so we did not study, for example, FITS or Texas Red. But I would assume that they also they have an, an impact on the confirmation. Thank you. Um, 
have you probed the integrity of the phospholipid membrane um, after the DNA origami have attached uh, to it? Does, do the membranes become porous? Yes, uh, this was also a question we had actually, and we addressed this via FRAP. So we did FRAP of the lipids and the DNA origami, and uh, you see that's the same diffusion coefficient before and after, uh, and even uh, of um, polymerized DNA origami and just loosely distributed DNA origami monomers. Um, so the lipids and the, um, the membrane is actually intact in, in this case. Thank you. Um, have you been able to characterize the, the sizes of the, of the patches of DNA origami, that is how many origami uh, uh, combined together? Um, so I assume the, the question, so, so on, on, on the GV membrane, this is hardly feasible because I mean, we don't see the individual um, origami monomers. And um, in, in AFM studies, we're not looking at the discrete size of the patches I just showed you, but we were more looking at the correlation, for example, um, of different DNA origami monomers and their orientation. So this we definitely looked at, but for example, we did not classify the different cluster sizes um, because we also assume that they are slightly different on the GOV membrane rather than on the mica surface in the AFM. Right. Thank you very much. Um, sure. So uh, that we've come to the end of, of the questions. So thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, the, the uh, the slide uh, currently shown uh, is the invitation uh, for uh, uh, next week, which is the final uh, session of the speaker series of the CINSO conference. Uh, once again, please register for the main conference event, which will be May the 18th through the 20th. Thank you. <laughs>